I'm I'm just on a different level physically, um, and I think a big part of that is is just due to the training. Uh, it's been a complete shift as far as what I'm doing in training day to day. It's like completely actually opposite of what I used to do. Everybody, welcome to The Move. We are here with George Hincapi and Johan Bernil. I'm Spencer Martin from the Beyond the Peloton newsletter. We are discussing Torino Adiratico and Perry Nice, the dueling stage races that happened last week and end of the weekend. Torino was won by Jonas Vindigo in a pretty dominant performance that uh, doesn't speak well to anyone else trying to win the Tour de France. We'll break that down, though, and then get into Matteo Jorgensen's The Young Americans. I would say pretty surprising and impressive GC victory at Perry Nice. We actually have Matteo joining us about halfway through the show to discuss his win. So we're very excited to talk to him about that. But first, we'll talk about Torino, what we learned there before getting into Perry Nice with uh, with Matteo. But Johan, what are your quick quick takeaways from Torino? I mean, it got a, I feel like a little overshadowed by Perry Nice, which was a super exciting GC race that came down to the very end. They do that course is so good at kind of building into the final day a lot can change in the final day you had a lot of parody at the gc level there terreno it was kind of either a, a sprint stage i guess you did have the time trial at the beginning which kicked off the uh the the tt helmet fiasco that we lived through for the rest of the week but it's really just tt sprint and then Jonas dominating the mountain stages. I mean, what did you take away from this race, big picture wise? I don't know if you've checked the cost of a new bicycle right now, but it's as much as a motorcycle. Me and my friends are all talking about that, and we just can't get past it. When you could get a gently used, barely ridden, uh, almost new bicycle from Bicycle, B Y C Y C L E, it's a, really an incredible interface of what you're looking for. You put in the style of bike you're looking for, the size, what kind of components, whether it's electronic, mechanical, what brand, even if you know that far in advance what you want, what kind of wheels, boom, it spits out everything that fits your criteria and you could be on the bike you've always wanted. Also, you could clear out that garage. If you have a bike that's been laying there for, and you haven't touched it in a year, it's probably time to sell it and turn it into the bike you always wanted. And uh, at Bicycle, they actually have an offer where you can remove, they'll remove the seller fee for our listeners. So all you have to do is enter we do 24 wedu 24 we do 24 at bicycle.com and they'll remove that seller fee. Today's show also brought to you by Mando and uh, I'm not making this up. It was five years ago or so. My daughter got on me for using a deodorant that had aluminum in it. So I went online and bought like 10 different brands uh, and narrowed it down to one. I did a test on all of them. One that, you know, and one that I thought in my opinion was the best until we uh, became partners with Mando and they sent me some of their product. The old one that I had chosen from that test of 10 products, threw it out, no longer need it. And uh, I'm a big fan of Mando's products now, and they are aluminum free. So they fit that criteria. Uh, you should check out their starter pack. It's perfect for new customers. It can comes with a uh, solid stick deodorant, a cream tube deodorant, and two free products of your choice that you can pick out from there. Uh, and again, special offer for our listeners, $5 off the starter pack with our exclusive code and link. Use the code we do at shopmando.com. That's shopmando.com. And the code is we do. The conclusion is that Jonas Vingegaard is definitely uh, on a super high level. Um, yeah, I, I, It's difficult to say and compare, but I would I dare to say that he's on a higher level than last year at this time. Uh, let's not forget, you know, last year he did Paris-Nice and he got beaten like fair and square by Tadej Pogacar. He was not even second. He was third in Paris. So this year in, um, in Tireno, those two big, uh, hilly stages, he was, you know, head and shoulders above everybody else. Um, I think that's the main takeaway. Um, other than that, um, Juan Ayuso, uh, confirms that he is the guy of the future. I mean, beating, people Ghana in the time trial on a flat time trial. And then the only guy that could at some point stay with, uh, Ringegaard only for a little bit, but you know, he finished second in GC. Uh, I think that's definitely a good sign. Um, 
And then, uh, I mean, I really, really impressed with this young Mexican Del Toro, Isaac Del Toro, who is, you know, 14 GC, 20 years old. Um, we haven't seen the last thing from this guy yet. George, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to mention that, Johan. Um, not only incredibly impressive ride, but apparently struggles a bit with positioning, starts a lot of these climbs in the back, or maybe that's uh, his style, a la Ryder Hejdal, starting in the back of the climb, not fighting, saving energy, which to me is very risky, but working his way through groups at his own pace, uh, essentially climbing just as fast uh, overall time as the best guys in the race. Um, very impressive to watch him, young kid and, and UAE. I mean, they're killing it on the young kid program right now. They're, their best guys are all <laughs> under 25 years old. And, um, you know, they have the budget, they have the long-term vision, and it's, it's going to be hard to crack, you know, that dominance for a while. But uh, very impressive by both of their young riders. And also, uh, as we all know, these races, both Torino and Paris-Nice, are are where the favorites start emerging for Milan San Remo, which is next weekend, of the first World Cup of the year. And for me, Jonathan Milan made an incredible race, third in the second or third in the in the time trial, the first time trial, uh, won two stages, lots of power, climbing well. Uh, to me, he's got to be emerging as one of the clear favorites. And Trek has won that race before. I'm going to disagree. To I'm going to disagree with you. Okay, I like it. That's why we're on here. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to disagree because I think that I think that uh, well, I mean, I think one of the big favorites is is uh, Mathieu van der Poel, who hasn't raced yet. His first race is Milan San Remo. Um, there's other riders, but I think uh, Jonathan Milan, uh, the leader of his team, is the big favorite in my opinion. Uh, Mats Peterson. He's, I think he's one of the biggest favorites uh, for, for uh, Milan Sanremo. Jonathan Milan, um, I think he's going to struggle with the distance and, uh, and, and the Poggio. Um, of course, you know, I mean, if this would have been five, six, seven years ago, I would say, okay, you know, it's, but nowadays we see that there's three, four riders who are so good that you know, it's not a bunch print anymore. When is the last time Milan San Remo was a bunch print or a, a group of 20, 30 riders? I mean, there's, and I, you know, I think with a guy like Van der Poel and, uh, at the start and uh, Pogacar at the start, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm yeah, not definitely. Sure about that. Yeah, yeah. I think sure. he is. He, he yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think it's going to be, it's, you know, it's going to be very difficult. Um, I was talking to one of our, you know, one of I, I, yeah, I agree, Johan, but it also really depends on the wind conditions. If, say, for instance, yeah, yeah. if we have a headwind of this presser or a headwind of the Pojo, it completely changes the dynamics of the race. And historically speaking, you need to race before Milan San Remo. Of course, these big favorites like Vanderpool, they don't need to race anymore. They just <laughs> historically, show up ready to George, rock. you just said um, it. Historically, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's, it, it's, agree. it's changed. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, the game has changed for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, I mean, now that we're talking about, about uh, Milan San Remo, I mean, my favorite. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know what Van der Poel is going to do and how he's going to show up. For sure, he's going to be, you know, come in all guns blazing. Uh, but Max but, Peters but, is my but, big favorite uh, because I think that he's, you know, he's incredibly strong already the whole season. Uh, he was really strong in, in Paris-Nice. And if you look at last year, he's the last guy who was just not able to make it with those four big engines so i think that yeah. this year he will be able to make it and he's well and, the, and the, the the team you know trek bringing on Lidl and their their big talk was about we're going to bring a lot more money in we want yeah. to be one of the top three four teams in the world they're showing that right now they're very sure. um, successful start of the year they got tom scusian got second in um strata bianca matt peterson is obviously riding amazing jonathan milan i mean they have a stacked stacked squad past winner of the of the milan san remo as well will probably be their students I think or not. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I think about their squad, they need to be going in with, they will be going in with a ton of confidence, not scared of anybody. Um, so for me, I like the momentum that they're, that they have right now. And uh, I'm going to go slightly with the, I'm going to go with the Italian because it's an Italian race and, uh, George, and but the look pressure how, look, is all in him. We keep saying, we keep saying, you know, things have changed, you know, let's uh, it's, 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 it's kind of strange to see that, you know, historically, and I, say, I, I insist historically, you know, it was Tireno and Milan, uh, Tireno and Parinis, as you had to do one of those two races to 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 win. You know, now we're talking about probably the two biggest favorites, which are Van der Poel and Pogacar, and none of them has done either of these races. 
and they're going to be there and they're going to be in, on the podium. One of them is going to be on the podium of that race. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I agree. I mean, Jonathan Milan, listen, uh, he, he wins two stages, uh, beating, you know, really, really fast sprinters. Jasper, Jasper Philipson, Tim Merlier, uh, uh, Phil Bauhaus, you know, they were all there, uh, and he, and he beats them. And then I don't know. I mean, I don't know if a guy like, for example, if Visma, uh, what about Olaf Koy? I mean, can he make it? He's, he's, he's super fast. <laughs> We, we, we've fast. underlined how exciting Torino was because we've rocketed through and we're discussing Milano San Remo <laughs> after about three takeaways. But George, I was thinking about this too, about Milan. You know, I started to daydream about Milan winning Milano San Remo, Italian rider, big Italian sprinter. Like he kind of looks like he's a statue that just happens to be on a bike. Yeah. It is tempting to think about, but I, I have a hard time imagining he, he can get up the Poggio fast enough. Like they've gotten so fast on the Poggio. Last year was unbelievable. Like, you know, if you look at some of the estimated power numbers required, that seems like a little bit of a stretch. It would have to be some funky day with a stiff headwind. Maybe Little Trek gets two riders over. If you can get two riders over the Poggio, you can win. Come on, guys. It's easy. That's all you have to do because you're going to have one attack and one sits in the group. But I don't know. I mean, are we... Are we glossing over the other Italian? Like, is is Filippo Ghana the the sleeping giant here? Yeah, I mean, I, that's also a possibility. He was very close last year. Um, has the power numbers. I just like the physique of a guy like Jonathan Milan, big guy. And we always talk about the suppress and the pojo, but we don't talk so much about the battle for the suppress and the pojo. And you want to be a big, strong guy, not afraid of positioning, not burning up all your energy to stay in the first five, ten guys. Somebody like Jonathan Milan, he can do that relatively easy and not get guys bumping into him because they'll get bounced right off of him. I like his physique. I like the, you know, the role that he's on. And I mean, like you said, it's Milan Serena, anything can happen. They've been flying up to Poggio every year, faster and faster. So it is a long shot, but I still like him. Yeah. But let's, let's, uh, you know, let's talk again about, about Jonas Vingegaard and Tireno Adriatico. I mean, how impressive is that, uh, you know, he started the season, won the three stages in, in the race in Galicia in O Gran Camino. Not the same competition, but, you know, Bernal was there, Carapaz was there, Udan was there. I mean, there, there was, I mean, there was really good riders there. Uh, but you could say, okay, you know, it's, it's a secondary race. But, I mean, to show what he has shown and the way, to me, it's, it's just, he just, he just knows when he's when he's going to go, and he knows when he's going to drop them. Yeah. Uh, and he's not afraid to attack from far out. You know, it's not like he waits. I mean, he waits until the last moment. He just goes, and he has this extra gear. Uh, it seems that nobody can nobody can follow. I mean, that's, and I think what what Ayuso said was telling. You know, in the the second uh, mountain stage, he tried. To follow him, he tr I tried a little bit, and then he said, "All of a sudden, I just blew up. I had to gasp for air." And he said, "I'm the first of the humans," yeah, which shows <laughs> what how impressed the peloton is with the level of Jonas Winger. Not only that, Johan, but I feel like the the communication and um, the way the, the the teammates, the the Keldermans, and the, they know each other so well that they essentially know the exact effort that they're going to do before they blow up. And when Jonas needs to go, that everybody else yeah. is on the limit and nobody's going to be able to react. I mean, they've got that dialed in. Um, and, and we all know Pogacar is dominating as well as dominated in Strada Bianca, but like the favorites are, are, are clearly emerging, uh, for the, for the race of the, the big race in July there. Yeah. I mean, I, it seems to me like it gets more and more. I mean, we've been saying this now for a number of years, you know, how can you be so good in the beginning of the season, like straight from the, from the gun and then still be there. But it just, it doesn't seem to matter anymore. You know, it, it's already now that it's, there's no doubt that, you know, you can be on a super high level, although all that time they do race relatively uh, little, you know, I mean, there's guys who, you know, including the tour, they're probably going to have, 40 races, 40 races. Uh, some, some guys have 15 to 20 races before the tour, if that, um, uh, but man, and we, how hard these training rides must be, you know, because, uh, some guys actually prefer to train hard rather than be in races where you are at the mercy of what the Peloton wants to do. And yeah, you, sometimes you have a stage, you know, it's headwind and they don't get the necessary work in. We're, I, we're still, I, still, I still struggle with understanding. I, obviously the training, 
is a lot more advanced. The the measuring, the nutrition is a lot more advanced. But for us, always back in the day, yeah, you can do the intervals. You can do the power on the climbs that you need to do in races. But the hardest thing, in my opinion, in races is the acceleration out of corners, you know, the fighting for position. The, those things are almost not a factor to these guys anymore. They don't need it. They They just do their intervals. And the accelerations, people don't understand what it's like to be in a Peloton the size of a mile long yeah. and getting slingshotted out of a corner and have to sprint full gas just to hold the wheel in front of you. Those things are almost impossible to mimic in training, but somehow they, they're not missing a beat. They don't need to race yeah. anymore. Um, they're training and they're, they're super fine with all these accelerations and the strong out Pelotons uh, and the positioning. It's just, it's, to, it's really hard to understand, but they've figured it out. Yeah, we. I think we should we should ask Matteo. Uh, he's going to come yeah, in a little bit. Because, I agree. Because you know, if you look at him, you no, know, his first race was Omlop at Newsblad, and he, he was one. Anything. And he was one of the strongest riders in the race. Yeah. You know, yeah. So basically, they show up. It doesn't matter. They have the rhythm, and they have the speed, and they just go. You know, it's crazy. I mean, I didn't they race the level of you and George, but I I agree, George. I mean, I can train all I want, but I can like feel the sickness in my stomach almost, you know, the first race of the year where you're just like, it's mm -hmm. like getting punched in, in the gut yeah. where you're just like, Oh <laughs> yeah. my God, trying to hold those wheels in the corners, but it doesn't seem to bother them at all. And I'm, I'm not, I don't really have an answer for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Do you guys feel like, I mean, these Jonas wins, they're physically impressive. I do see like people calculating numbers online. Like this is as big as bigger performance as he's doing at the tour. We should say these are shorter stages, like three and a half hours, the demands leading into the climbs are far less, you know, it's just less of a yeah. fight. Um, the climbs are shorter. So you should keep all that in mind. He still has a level to go before the tour, but it almost as if he like has a, it remind it's Lance esque and that it almost feels like he doesn't like his competitors. And I'm not saying he doesn't, I'm not trying to say that, but he rides in that way of just like, you don't need to do this Jonas, but you're just destroying these people really <laughs> almost just to show them a, like show them a point of like, I'm this good. What are you going to do about it? I, I, I agree with that. Spencer also, it's almost like he he's, he he's doing it for training. He's trying, trying yeah. to hold these numbers and he's like, I need to, I need to get this particular amount of power for this particular amount of time. So I'm going to might as well do it in the race and win the race <laughs> where most guys are like, okay, I'm leading comfortably. I'll just ride in here. But I feel like he's a lot of this is just, he's trying to keep his training going. But that's but how don't he feels about Pogacar. At the don't you think that that's like? I think that's proper to the to the actual generation and the way cycling is is being ridden right now. Because if you look, I, I, tactics have become very secondary, in my opinion. And then on to, on top of that, you know, being liked or not being liked, or having friends in the peloton, or doing deals between teams that was usually the case in the past. It's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. They just ride as fast as they can with a team. Like, like Jumbo, Jumbo last year in the tour, you know, they just had, they had this team. They had, you know, uh, eight guys. They knew that they had, you know, five guys who could do five watts per kilo for 150 K. Then they had two guys who could do six watts per kilo uh, for, for the last climb. And then they had Jonas who can do 6.5, 6.8 watts per kilo. And, and, and basically I think, I think it, cycling has come th down to this, that it's basically a numbers game uh, and they know exactly what they can do for how long tactics are. I mean, we can talk all, all, all day long about this. This is a tactical mistake. I don't think there are any more tactical mistakes. Uh, it's just pure numbers and power. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I mean, but we, we read some of the reports already about Paris Nice where Remco said he made some technical errors by letting these guys ride away. Um, but maybe that, I, perhaps there I agree. In, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. Perhaps focus in on, uh, you know, Primos, obviously, and, and not uh, not those guys. But look, uh, those, and we haven't really even started talking about Paris Nice, but those, those were hard days and only a handful of guys left. If one guy goes, um, clearly he's got that kind of power. And so close to the overall, it's not somebody you can just let right away. I mean, you got to, you got to react. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. I agree. Do we have anything else about, uh, Tireno? I mean, uh, Jasper Philipson, uh, won a stage, you know, looked like he he's, you know, 
he's uh, up to speed, but then he had a crash in, in the, in the next stage and he probably was hindered a little bit. Phil Bauhaus, um, impressive stage win also, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think he's won a stage. Doesn't he win a stage here every year? It's like an annual Phil Bauhaus. He won a stage, stage, he won a stage last year for sure. Um, and then yeah, it was very uh, impressive. The battle for the with the sprinters was very impressive. Uh yeah. four, was it three or four different sprinters won stages, uh, which is not typical. I mean, usually we'll see one guy dominate two or three stages, yeah. but uh makes it makes it's gonna make a lot of these sprints a lot more exciting. And if in this in the in the rare chance nowadays that Milan San Remo comes down to 50 guys, that's gonna be a, a pretty interesting uh, finale to watch. Any, uh, George, any insight on uh, Cav and his um, at Tireno? Not really. I think I think that day was a very, very tight uh, window in terms of the uh, elimination. <laughs> and he just wasn't feeling that great. Uh, you know, he had he had a lot of travel. He was in Colombia for a month, went home for a day and a half, had to fly over to the UAE. Um, and then, then fly back and jump straight into Torino a couple of days later. It's just that's just a ton of travel on anybody. Um, so I think I think he's fine. And he'll I have be to say though, I have to benefits. say, I have to be honest, George. I mean, I, I'm getting worried about Calf. I'm getting worried about Calf that he's not going to get to the level he needs. I know, I know that the tour, the tour comes and it's a different the animal, right? But man cycling keeps evolving i mean and, and and it seems like it's every year a little a tiny bit faster and i'm i'm, I'm getting worried especially also because his team his team is not very strong yeah not strong enough. i'm not he's you know i saw i spent time with him in colombia he's the main thing for me with cab is like how happy is he how how motivated is he is he having fun and he's having a great time he's happy and he he's got his eye on the on the prize i think all of this stuff obviously he probably wanted to finish Torino, but it's just his buildup. I mean, he's got one clear focus. Uh, I'm not. I'm not worried. Okay. Good. Well, oh, I, I hope. I hope so. I hope. So. I would love to see him break that record. But uh, yeah. it's he has his work cut out for sure. He's so good at that, though. I'm. I used to doubt him all the time, but I mean, he feels like he can just pull. He can look so bad, so bad, so bad. Then he just pulls tour form out of thin air. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of. I mean, I think he would have won a stage last year had he not crashed, and he looked terrible. And his Astana team, I thought, looked worse. Early in the year, so yeah, I that, still little, think a that little that little gear mechanical was uh, why he lost that day. Hundred percent, I think he would have won uh, without a doubt. And like you said, Spencer, he gets to the tour and he's a different, completely different person. The year with Quickstep when he got last minute slotted in, I think I spoke to him ten days before the tour, and he's like, "Man, I don't even know if, if I'm ready. I don't know if I'm going. If I go, of course I'll go. I'll be happy to go." But point is, a week before the Tour de France, that he won four stages and he wasn't even. Sure, how crazy. good he was. That's so, just crazy. Um, crazy, yeah. crazy, crazy. Did you notice, Perfect. Johan? So, Philipson looked, I thought, completely outclassed at UAE. You kind of you get back to Europe, harder stages, sh like smaller roads, a little bit more elevation game, and he looks better than Tim Merlier. You know, it's like I think you're st you're going to see that Philipson is is the premier sprinter for these like harder Grand Tour S stages. And that I don't think that that's going to change this year. I think that's the one place where you could be Milan, you know, in harder, harder Grand Tour stages. Today's show is brought to you by AG1. I remember when we first started talking about AG1 three, four years ago, and no one knew what the product is. And we were explaining it. This is Athletic Greens. It's something that should be a part of your routine every single day. Fast forward uh, three, four years later, you can just say AG1. You don't have to show anybody the product. You don't have to spell out that it's athletic greens. It's become the standard in that daily nutrition that you need. I've made it a part of my routine every single day. I get those vitamins, minerals, uh, pre and, and probiotics and more. It's just a simple, simple start of the day. It tastes good. It mixes easy. It takes you less than a minute to change your habits and it's well, well worth it. So uh, I have to recommend you elevate your health It's AG1. That's the best way to do it. We've been partners with them for a long time and we want you to take ownership of your health. Start with AG1. Uh, and with uh, trying AG1, you'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash the move. That's drinkag1.com slash the move.
Today's show is also brought to you by our friends at Caldera Lab. And it it is funny. It has changed the habits of everyone on the show. You know, most of the team, all dudes, most of the team over 40, most of the team, all of the team did not take care of their skin growing up. And all of us out in the sun a lot, uh, really active and just not taking care of ourselves. Now that we've partnered with Caldera Lab, I've gotten comments from my wife, my daughter. I know Lance has gotten comments. George is addicted to the product. Uh, he start, he carries it around in his bag all the time and is applying it throughout the day. We've all got hooked on taking better care of our skin. In particular, I use a cream every single day before I leave the house. I use the good, which is the serum at night and it is improved. I know I don't have the best looking face here as an example, but it has improved and you should be taking better care of your skin. Get 20 percent off with the code we do at calderalab.com. You can make unforgettable first impressions that lead to charming words. You look younger. 20% off at calderalab.com with the code we do. Well, I guess I guess we have uh, our special guest uh, yes. on the way. So let's see. Hey, there he is. Hey, Mateo. Hey, thanks for joining. Yes. Mateo, congratulations. Thanks for having Incredible. Me. Incredible. To watch. Congratulations. What, what an incredible victory, um, you know, this, hopefully the start of, of many more, but, uh, you know, lots of, lots of young, good riders have won. I mean, it was the first big victory of Miguel Indurain. So, you know, you have, you have somebody to follow there. <laughs> yeah. The, the list of winners for Paranese is, uh, yeah, it's something insane. I don't really want to even look at. Yeah. Anyway, so how do you, how do you feel the day after? How do you yeah. feel the day after, Mateo? Actually, pretty good, I have to say. I expected worse in the past. After the Monday after Paranese, I'm usually uh, kaput on the on the sofa all day. But today, I've been pretty good. I've had a lot of stuff to do with. Had like six interviews and stuff, so maybe that's just more adrenaline. But uh, but yeah, it's it's been feeling pretty good. Yeah, I'm impressive. Spencer made a great point um, early on the, in the show that you basically not only won handily, but you outrode the best riders in the world. I mean, you lost time in the time, team time trial, which is kind of unexpected. We didn't, we didn't know if you guys just were trying not to take as many risks as the other teams, but for you to be there and ride away from these guys, uh, we knew that you were strong. Obviously, you almost won head bulk, um, but to come out and say that you wanted to get podium in Paris Nice and then win it, uh, incredibly impressive. Walk us through those first couple of days, wh what you were thinking, how you were feeling and how everything played out for you. Yeah, I, I, I didn't really go into the race with, yeah, the, the expectation to win, like the team was not expecting that. Thankfully, uh, if they were, I would probably wouldn't have performed very well with, with pressure the whole time, but they really would have been happy with the top 10 is what they told me in like January when we went over the race. But I've, I've been eighth twice already. So I told them I'm not super interested in just doing a top 10. I, I'm, I would like to aim for uh, at the podium is what is what I thought was possible. And so we kind of went in with that intention. Uh, also knowing with that, yeah, normally with Remco and Fremos there, I don't have the level of them. So I haven't ever uh, performed um, yeah, on a level where I can beat either of those guys. So I think the podium was a reasonable objective, but in the end, um, the week just, just turned out. Yeah. Just, uh, it, it just went well in, in every aspect. And yeah, like you said, the TTT, I think was the one day that I guess I can be, I, I wouldn't say I was disappointed with it, with, with how we did it. I think we actually had a really good ride and I was like super happy with, with all the guys performance. I think we did like a really actually a good, a good ride, but we were just kind of flicked by the conditions, um, along with quick step. They were also in the same similar start time to us, but we, yeah, it, it was on a kind of a point to point route and the wind just completely changed as a storm blew in. And then it, it rained also with this storm and it just like the whole way home was this flat straight run in on a big road. And yeah, in the recon, it was like, pure tailwind and in the recon we were doing like super easy riding we were going like 70k an hour and then in the race we were pushing 
literally full gas and we were doing like 68 K an hour. So it, it just it completely flip flopped on us. Um, but yeah, I can't really complain about that. That's just how, how life is. And Remco was also on the same time it was really just UAE that profited from good conditions that day. So the rest of the days went super well. And Olav also took two stage wins, which was actually the team's main objective of the week was target the three sprint stages and try to win all of them with Olaf. So it just was a magic week. Yeah. I mean, you say Mateo that you're, you're not on the level of Primo's you're not on the level of Remco, but there was a point stage six Primo's attacks. You know, you think, Oh, I've seen this before. I know it's going to happen here. Race regroups. You go, you counter. And, and I, to me, that's the moment where you won Perry nice. What was going through your mind when you made that attack? Yeah, you're completely right. That that is really the the moment where I was able to take time on Remco and um yeah, I I it's funny every every time you see a, a race with two big leaders like whether it's Vingegaard, Pogacar or Primoz Remco or whoever like these big super towns, people always say, "Oh, you know, like you can take advantage when they look at each other." But the amount of times that that happens in a bike race when there's a guy who can, yeah, where the two strongest guys in the race, like, uh, you know, are taken advantage of by a third guy is just not, it just rarely happens. But, um, yeah, I, I did talk with Mark that morning on that stage and that climb is just so steep that Cole's closer loop climb that it was like worth it basically <clears throat> to try something no matter what we do, even if they're in the wheel, because there was just no draft. <clears throat> so like, yeah, we, I basically just agree with, with Mark that if there is a moment of hesitation, just go, like, don't even think about it because it, yeah, it just is always going to be worth it. Even if nothing happens and it all comes back together, they all have to do the same effort. So it just worked out and it was good timing. And, uh, it, it literally is what happened. I think Primo's had attacked and it annoyed Remco. Remco had to close the gap on him and it actually cost Remco, I think a lot there to close the gap. And, um, then once he came back, both of them were, you know, they both kind of canceled each other out and both of them thought, well, no, it's up to you to, to now, uh, to, to close the next gap. So I think it just was the right timing. Not only that, but you had super narrow, windy, wet roads that I feel like you guys took real advantage of getting every second you could in those corners. I mean, once you get, like they say, out of sight, out of mind, um, it was going to be really hard to bring you three guys back no matter what. I mean, were you, were you taking big risks or are you, did you know what was coming? You knew the course before that, or once you got the gap, it was just what was going through, what was going on in your head there? Yeah, that day I did, I did know all the roads I had. This stage was planned, uh, for last year, but it was canceled in Pyrenees, but I'd done the recon last year and I remember doing this climb. Um, and yeah, I, like you said, over the top, it was like, these crazy neighborhood roads they found. I don't know where they found these roads, but it was like right, left, up, down. Uh, yeah, just some good roads for attacking really. And basically once, um, Brandon and Skelmos got up to me, it was like, at least Brandon and I had the exact same intention for the day, which really helped out a lot. Like we both were just fully committed to taking time in the GC on Remco and making the most of the day. And so we were fully committed. Uh, Skelmos wasn't really, he was going for the stage and, um, that hindered us a bit, but thankfully Brandon had great legs and we're both bigger guys and it was basically false flat down to the finish. So yeah, we, I think we were able to take really big advantage and also behind, I'm sure when you have Remco and Primo's in a group, the other guys that were there probably were leaning on them a lot. So I think just, yeah, good, good, uh, group dynamics worked out in our favor. And it just, this was, yeah, I think the day that that made the difference. After that day, I mean, you still had two really tough days ahead. You were super strong at this race last year. Like I remember you were in that Jonas group behind Pagacar on the final day, I'm sure putting out massive numbers. But you, in my mind, you looked unshakable those last two days, like always, always in the front going into the sense like what you don't have to tell us, but I, I would guess that you're around like the same fitness as you were last year. But what's the difference being on Visma versus Movistar? Like, is there just an internal kind of emphasis on like be in the front, do this, do that? Are you getting more bottles? Like, what's the big difference this year that's allowed you to go from eighth to first? 
Yeah, I'm I'm just on a different level physically. Um and I think a big part of that is is just due to the training. Uh it's been a complete shift as far as what I'm doing in training day to day. It's like completely actually opposite of what I used to do. Um, yeah, I can't tell you specifically what, what efforts and stuff we're doing, but it's like just radically different than, than the training I used to do. And and that, yeah, is just one aspect, but that in combination with like having just, yeah, the past five months I've had like perfect, a perfect diet basically just because I've been with the team so much and they always have everything controlled while you're at camps and then at home, I've been yeah staying on track also, so I think I'm also quite quite a bit lighter and yeah, just everything kind of has come together to the point where I'm just at a higher level. Um, and that I didn't really know that going into the race. I mean, I felt super good at an opening weekend and was doing good numbers in Tenerife at the altitude camp before opening weekend, but it's not like you really know until you until I got onto the into the weekend where you know you you see those long climbs and you actually test yourself against those guys on the longer efforts where you can see yeah where you stand and I think I think you're right I I, I for the first time felt like I was on on the level of those guys and that's a completely new thing no I was gonna say Mateo you, you yeah no I, I, you can't I, talk, uh, I know you can't talk more uh, much about your training specifically but would you say the training is mentally and physically harder or is it just much more precise of a method of training for you uh, the workload is it tougher or is it just just more precise and more dialed in uh yeah i think in some ways i wouldn't say it's harder no uh i think in general i'm kept a lot less fatigued so i think the big thing is they it's just yeah it's much more um it's just plan to a higher level of, of, uh, precision, I guess, to the point where, you know, you're just not getting super tired. You're, there's no days where you finish and you're just like completely fucked. Like you, you, you do hard training, but it's all in a balance to where it's like the days that you have hard training, you're ready for it. You're fueled for it. You've rested for it. And then you do the hard training and then you recover again. So it's like, it's, it's very much calculated, I think to that degree. And is something that I have no idea about. I mean, there's like, uh, yeah, I'll, the coaching group, they spend hours and hours, you know, pouring into it and figuring it out. But yeah, I just kind of follow the process. But the one thing I've noticed is that I'm just less tired um, off the bike. Like when I'm at home, I can, you know, I'm, it's not a big chore to get up and go to the grocery store and uh, yeah, mm-hmm. go see friends or something. It's like uh, have energy to do things off the bike, which is pretty big change actually. I think it's probably also the, the one of the, I mean, I'm, I, I, can, I think I can, I can, I mean, I followed your interviews a bit and your way of thinking, Mateo, and when you were at Movistar, um, you were already pushing, I, I think, to, to, to be a bit more scientific and, and specific, but you had to do everything on your own initiative or most of it. <clears throat> and now everything is done for you. You don't have to worry about it, that it's going to be done. Um, and so uh that's probably i mean with all due respect for for movistar you know they're a great team and they've been you know in in business for a long time but but i think it's still i mean with you know respectfully old school a bit old school uh they're trying to catch up but i probably i think that probably right now at at visma you see a huge difference uh, on that on that part that everything is thought about and everything is done for you uh, is that not the case? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're definitely right. I think, um, I think a big part of, uh, the success of the team is, is because, uh, yeah, you, I think actually cycling and endurance sport in general is about like managing stress and, uh, I'm, I'm just, yeah, it's just on my mind right now because I'm reading a book about stress and it's like, you start to realize what we're actually doing, like what the goal of training is. And it's basically all you're doing in training is just stressing your body and um, you're doing it in certain ways to create like adaptations and then recover from those. And um, I think the more things that you can take off of your plate as a rider, the more successful, like the training is going to be for you. So 
Yeah. The, the, like the more time you can spend disconnected after training and, and, and relaxing and yeah, the more you can put yourself into like a, a more recovery state, the better you're going to actually like adapt to the training. And that's something that I never really realized before. I thought you kind of, if you got the workout done, then your body will, will make the adaptations kind of no matter what you do, but it's, it's a lot about, yeah, your mental state. And I think this team knows kind of how to, or at least they, they really put a lot of effort into trying to keep you happy and, and, um, yeah, keep you low stress and take a lot of the responsibilities off of you as a, as a rider, because you already have quite a few things you have to worry about. And, and so I think, yeah, you just have a bit more space to do that. And then you can, yeah, you can just adapt better to the training. I think that's, that's a big thing. Mm. Mateo, I know we, I, we, we want to be respectful of your time. You, I know you had like 20 interviews today. I, I have one last question for you. Is this wind going to change um, your schedule at all? Uh, your, any, anything, any plans change or too early to tell? He's, I'm hoping you're still going to do like Flanders in that because you almost won Het Volk, which is one of my favorite races. And those types of races are my favorite races. George, to see, George. To see an American. George, it's his news block. These guys don't know what's about, Okay, whatever. I was, that was, <laughs> it was called that before. But I'd love to see you back there. I don't know if that's going to change your schedule at all, but um, what's what's up next for you? No, no changes. <laughs> that's one of the things this team doesn't uh, doesn't do is they don't change your change your schedule. They make a plan and they stick with it. And and uh, I, I also think it's going to be great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the classics. I, I do now... I have like 10 days before E3 and then I do E3, Doris Door of Lander and um, Flanders, Roubaix and Amstel. So that's kind of my block and they're all races that I really look forward to. And after opening weekend, it's like, that was such a crazy, uh, it's just, I had to pinch myself lining up with the team that strong in a race. Like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's something that I can't take for granted because it's not many times in my life, maybe that I'll line up with that amount of uh, firepower on one team. And I, that's also the team we have for a lot of the next classics. So I'm looking forward. So Mateo, you have, it, you've done three races with, uh, with the team now, right? So you, you've done, you've done uh, Nisblad, you've done Kuren and Karinis. So three out of three, right? <laughs> yeah. Three out of three for the team. Yeah. Yeah. Not for yeah. me, but for the team. Yes. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Yeah. Uh, to, 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 to finish, uh, Mateo, I have to give you many regards and congratulations from uh, Club Ciclista San Sebastián de los Reyes. I know you were, you and your brother uh, rode there when you were nine and 10 years old, I guess. Uh, your, your, your mother, I don't know if you know, but your mother wrote me about that because my son is, my son is, the, is in the same club. So you are, uh, of, yes, of course, a, a, a big, to a big topic uh, and, and lots of congrats from everybody at the club. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have good memories. Yeah. That was a, that was a cool, I spent like a semester or something in, in Spain. I was pretty young. Yeah, I was like nine, but I have good memories from that. That was a really cool experience. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we really appreciate it, Mateo, and good luck for the rest of the year. We'll be we'll be watching and pulling for Thanks, you. Guys. Yeah. Thanks, right, thank good you. luck. Thanks, Mateo. Have a great day. Yes. Okay, Ciao, guys. Okay. Oh. Bye. That was great, guys. We had uh, the yeah. win winner of Perry Nice. Well, I think mm -hmm. is this the first time ever we've had two Americans on the podium of Perry Nice, Spencer. Yeah, I was thinking about that, George. I I think it might be the first time ever. I mean. Is it the first, when's the last time two Americans finished on the podium of, let's say like a top three one week stage race, like the Dauphiné, Paris, Nice and Swiss, you know, like, has that ever happened? Like, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty rare. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a, like we keep saying, I mean, the American cycling is in a great position right now. Um, and, and these guys are continuing to press and, and, and for me, it's, Mateo is just so impressive because he's racing the classic races too, like Flanders. I mean, he'll be up there yeah. most likely in Tour of Flanders, um, and then I mean, winning the climbers race like Paris Nice. Imagine this. I mean, this he did two races: the opening weekend in Belgium. You know what that is? I mean, it's 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 a different kind of cycling. It's it's two different yeah. sports, and he just yeah. goes to Paris Nice, shows up, actually states his intentions that he he's ambitious for a podium. And then and then wins it and in in which way you know I mean I was really impressed uh, on on the last stage I mean 
Ramco tried. I mean, he did not move an inch. He was always, I mean, it, I mean, he was suffering, of course, but he was in control of the situation. Um, and uh, I mean, man, for in, and that's also we we should have uh, we should have asked for his weight. I mean, he's a tall guy. Yeah. Uh, what What do you yeah. think his weight? What What do you think how how much he would weigh? Like I'd, seventy kilos. I'd say he's yeah in kilos. I'd say yeah, so like 72, 70, 72? 70, 70, yeah, 70 bet, kilos. I, my guess. I wonder if he's lighter than that. I, I wonder if he's in the high 60s. I mean, he looks oh, and, thin for his Yeah, height. he's super super lean. But what I think also really stood out to me was how his training has changed and how he's got a lot more energy for like normal yeah. life stuff. Going to the grocery that was store. Interesting. I mean, we all that know was interesting. when you train hard, you can't do anything. Like yeah. it's just amazing how dialed in this team has got the nutrition and yeah. the training. And um, of course, it's still incredibly hard, but the fact that yeah. you're able to recover more and uh, just recover scientifically where you were able to produce the work, adapt and do it again and win races like Paris Nice is, uh, you could see it in his face. He's happy. He's content with the team. Oh, yeah. um, and we're, I think we're going to see a lot more of him this year. Yeah. I mean, for them, you know, like two stage wins and the overall, that's, that's, that's incredible. Um, yeah. Another thing I wanted to talk about, about Paris Nice is, um, you know, of course, Remco second wins the last stage. He was one of the big favorites, couldn't win because Jorgensen showed that he was stronger. Uh, McNulty confirm, confirming that he's on a really great, great level, but uh, uh, the disappointment of Primoz Roglic, you know, uh, don't know if there was something wrong with him, but already at the beginning, they did race in the same circumstances as uh Visma and uh, Sudal Quickstep, but they lost a lot more time. They were already 40, 54 seconds down after the TTT, which is, you know, basically you can't win Paris Nice anymore uh, unless a miracle happens. Um, and then we never saw actually Primos in a situation where he really, I mean, he tried a few times, but it was very careful, very discreet. Um, uh, what happened? Uh, is he not on a, on a, on a, on the same level anymore since he left the team? What do you guys think? What, what do you think, George? I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to, you know, a, the way a lot of these guys played it back in our day where, you know, maybe they're just not, he's not going to put, he's got his, his big chance this year at the tour. So in my mind, it'd be like, I won't put as much emphasis on trying to win every single race I entered. Like I have in the last couple of years. And makes just sense. maybe, sense. maybe take it slightly easier to get the pressure off of me and then go all in for the tour. That's kind of what I'm feeling. I have no idea, obviously, but um, I'm not too concerned. And I think uh, once we get to the tour, we'll see the best primos. Well, Johan, do you well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. 20, yeah. yeah. 2019, where he looked unbelievable through every early stage race, like maybe the best one week stage racer of all time through the first part of 2019. He gets to the, sorry, I hope I have this year right. Yeah, 2019, he gets to the zero and you could just see the air deflate out of him. You know, he was good for the first week and he looks so bad for that second week. You know, I, I am slightly concerned. As the number one Primos fan over here, uh, I'm a little concerned about what I saw at Paranese. That's as bad as we've seen him, I think since he's been a high level pro. But I do wonder if George is right and that he's just made the decision of the tour is my, ch this is my chance to win the tour. I'm not messing around. I'm just focusing on that. He's going to try the inverse of that 2019 where he just kind of slowly got worse and, and maybe build it in an old fashioned way. Like yeah. who would, who would think that not being at your best every race could help maybe. So <laughs> that's yeah. the only thing I can, I can come up with because it and, was and, to see. I mean, and, and let's, let's, let's be frank here. Does, does it really matter to his career if he wins another Perry nice or if no, he wins another exactly. pays Basque or, I mean, who cares? He's won everything there is to do. It's that one race. So in my mind, yeah, it's like, yeah. let's go all in here. Cause nothing else really matters anymore. Yeah. And also, you know, I mean, it's, it's uh, once you are in a situation, let's say after the team time trial, and then you see how good these other guys are. I mean, it, Paris Nice is always won or lost with very little time difference. So, you know, it, it, it kind of, the motivation goes away a little bit also. And then, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he was still, except the last stage, I don't know exactly what happened, uh, if it was the cold or anything, but all, all the other stages, he was up there with all the favorites, right? It was just a matter of, yeah. of, of seconds, uh, here and there, but, uh, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I hadn't thought about that, George, but uh, it could, you could be right. You know, I mean, he has won every single race that there is to be won. Um, old fashioned approach, you know, just slowly riding into it and, and try to be as good as possible at, uh, yeah. at the Tour de France. So I like um, it. I what think else? It's, it's gonna build the, 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 you know, I think it's going to build up the anticipation even more. And, um, you know, we got those two big races behind us and now we got the big one days coming up. Um, obviously a lot more in between as well, but, uh, it was, it was some very exciting racing and to see the Americans there on top, just really icing on the cake for, for us. Johan, are you guys over at the Remco yeah. fan club? Are you concerned that Remco could not, I'm not, I'm not in the Remco fan club. Uh, <laughs> I mean, president and CEO. I like Remco it, but I'm also sometimes critical. I'm, I, I, I like Remco, but I'm, I'm the first one to be critical. You know, I mean, uh, He's, he's a great rider, um, but I still think that he has things to, to learn and to improve on tactically. And also, you know, the, the, this, I don't think he should do this, you know, the, the phone call well, and then hanging up yeah. when he wins the stage. No. And he kind of got gifted the stage, but like he didn't attack Jorgensen and then Jorgensen didn't contest the stage because he already won. That was a little yeah, strange. What was that me. about the, hang, the phone call hang up? Who was he hanging up on? Uh, man, it's the second time he does this this year. Uh, he did it when he won his first race in, in Portugal. I don't know. Apparently it's a gesture that some football player did at some point. And I don't, I, I don't, I have no idea what it is, but mm. I don't know, uh, <laughs> but it's just, it's just proper to the personality. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's okay. But to put yeah. it in a perspective, he's, he was, I thought Jorgensen was stronger on that final day. I thought if he wanted, he probably could have dropped Remco. And Jorgensen is not only not leading Visma at the tour, he's and he's not even their like lead mountain domestique. That's Sepkus. He's probably their third or fourth mountain domestique. And Remco couldn't beat him. I mean, as we say, this isn't the tour. The tour's later in the year, obviously. To me, if I that's concerning. And Sudal Quick Step, I mean, he was completely isolated on that final stage. They really just lost the wheel on the descent, on a wet descent. I would say I have some concerns about that team as tour contenders based on this? Well, I think, I think Spencer, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's no secret. I don't think we can put as, as for now, we can't put Remco at the same level as those clear tour de France favorites, uh, Jonas and, and Tadej and, and even Primos, you know, I mean, uh, I think he has, he still has progress to be, to, to make. Um, and, and I think the tour de France is going to be a learning process for him. Um, we'll obviously see him, uh, very active and aggressive, but um, I think top five would be a good a good goal for Remco. I don't think we should expect him to. I mean, in his mind, for sure, he he wants to win. You know, these guys when they start a race, they want to win. Yeah, uh, and he, I mean, he's unless he mentioned it. He mentioned in his post race interview how he's already thinking about July, won the last yeah. stage in Nice where the tour finishes. Um, so I don't think he's. He's he his morale is any lower from his performance at Paris. I think he's he's all in for July, and he's he's clearly stating that, calling it out early. So um, it's just shaping up to be a very exciting July, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Stage six was a howler. I mean, that was as mm -hmm. they would say in soccer, like to let a truck like Jorgensen and McNulty and Skelmoza go up the road. It's, well, I, I don't understand that. I mean, yeah. well, he, I mean, like he said, yeah. yeah well, he, he, it happens. Yeah. He, yeah, he he had to chase down Primos. Uh, you only have so many matches in a race, and um, yeah, the, the, like perhaps a moment of hesitation cost him the race. But like you said, Spencer, once you give those guys ten seconds, and like Mateo said, in those neighborhood roads, you're going full yeah. gas. It doesn't matter who's chasing you behind; you can only corner so fast. Um, it was just a great tactical move by Mateo, and perhaps not a not a wise decision by Remco. Yeah, agreed. All right. I think great. that's it. No. Yeah. Yeah. That great show guys. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Well, uh, we'll be back we for, uh, Milano San San Remo. Remo very soon. Yep. All right. Who's the quick picks? I got Jonathan Milan, Spencer. Who do you got? I mean, I, I'm going to steal this from Johan. I think Vanderpool. I, I, okay. I just, he's so good when he focuses on this race. Go okay. on. I'm Mats Pedersen. Ooh, I like that. All right. Good. I like it. Good picks guys. We'll see you next week then. Okay. Yeah, see you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs>